Hello and welcome to tonight's event for uh, the commemoration of the South Asian Heritage Month. Uh, my name is Kamala Patney and I'm very proud to be asked to host this event on behalf of um, the De Montfort University's Manov Utsav uh, Human Festival online event. Um, this is the second year uh, when we've run this and uh, this is our first attempt at uh, a new initiative. And so today's event, um, we are going to bring in a number of uh, South Asian influencers, uh, all of them women uh, who have had uh, very different journeys and uh, we will be talking to them. So it's a very um, relaxed and, and uh, open discussion. But before we get to that point, I will be introducing each person and uh, just hear a, a little bit about each each um, individual's journey. Um, so before I start, um, I'd just like to say, um, if you have any questions or comments, uh, please do put them on the uh, chat. Uh, this is a live event. It is being recorded and it will be available after the event has uh, stopped being live. Um, so it'll be immediately available. Um, and I encourage you to um, go to the um, bottom right hand corner of your uh, below your screen and subscribe to this channel and we will be you'll be kept updated of all the developments that uh, we have planned and we have some exciting events planned um, as we move forward. So um, we are uh, just as a side we will be looking for collaborations and sponsorships to deliver two particular events quite soon in september and november in september we want to commemorate um international day of peace uh, possibly a live event um in leicester and in november we want to deliver a satellite type event from a grassroots level um, to commemorate the um, well, COP26 sat um, sort of satellite event relating to COP26 um, here in Leicester again. And we hope you choose to get involved with us in delivering that. Um, and, and these are uh, times when we do need to work together, we feel. So just in relation to um, celebrate our similarities, we are very proud that um, we have been uh, able to work with the De Montfort University um, and uh, we're very uh, excited that since the uh, new vice chancellor has uh, joined the um, uh, De Montfort Uni that uh, the United Nations has extended the um, international hub status, the only university with international hub status in the UK for the most important um, United, Station, uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 16, which is peace, justice, and strong institutions. And we're looking forward to working uh, on this as a grassroots organization and in collaboration with uh, DMU in developing our memorandum, memorandum of understanding that we have since 2019. So uh, in that respect, I'm really proud to introduce you to some of the team at De Montfort University. Um, so the first um, is the vice, um, uh, uh, it's uh, Professor Shushma Patel. Um, she's just joined in November. Hello, hello Shushma. Hi. Thank you, thank, Hi. You for, uh, thank you for inviting me and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. I'll just give a little bit of a brief background. Um, so Sushma Patel has just joined the DMU in November um, and I've heard uh, her talk on the DMU event and I'm sort of very excited to, to hear about your story as well. Uh, and I'm sure our audience will be. So Sushma is a pro vice chancellor and dean um, of the Faculty of Com Computing, Engineering and Media. And she has had various roles uh, in London South Bank University, uh, including the Director of Research and Enterprise, um, Director of Education and Student Experience. Um, she has a BSc Honours Degree in Life Sciences, a PhD from Faculty of Medicine, Institute of Dermatology, 
uh, I could go on this. Uh, it's an amazing, uh, you know, uh, uh, background that um, I certainly feel very proud to have, uh, you know, you on board today. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, and she's an active researcher and also collaborates with international partners on funded research projects um, and knowledge. So um, just, you know, um, if, if I can just um, go into some, some sort of uh, um, background, if you can add to, to what I've just read and give us your passion and what, what uh, you see as a way forward in the DMU and uh, making change happen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cameron. Um, well, first of all, I'm passionate about education. I think it's uh, powerful. It um, provides opportunities. And I think that um, my role is if I make a difference on, to one person, one student, one member of staff, one member of the community, it will have a, a positive viral effect. And I know that viral effect in this particular <laughs> current time isn't probably the right analogy, but I think it's important to say that, you know, the impact that education has for those who, who want to engage in it and who can engage in it is really, really important. So for me, that making a difference is really important. Um, and so in terms of my background, um, my parents um, migrated from East Africa here when I was very young. My, and I've been brought up in London. So London ha was home um, to me and I'm very proud to be associated with Leicester right now. It's been a, um, a journey not, um, not uh, engineered or not, um, it was a journey by accident really that brought me here. Um, as you know, Asian parents will always want their children to be medics, doctors, dentists, accountants, you know, all the professions. Um, I was fortunate my parents wanted us just to have an education and to do what we were interested in doing and excel in, in that. And I think that's really um, been the foundations for me. And um, yeah, it's not been a straight journey, but that resilience building has been important. And I always encourage people that if you don't, um, if, you know, if you don't succeed the first time, try again. Um, it could be for any number of reasons that... Um, you didn't get what you want, were looking for, but not to give up. And for students, I think it's important because I always used to say to students, um, you, you know, they'd come and say to me, I'm giving up on this course because I've got, um, you know, arts. everyone these days, and especially the younger generation, have got a lot of um, uh, responsibilities. And uh, I used to say to them, fine, just, just get through this year and don't leave halfway through get something in the bag and then get through the next year and go out but whatever you do try your hardest and do your best to achieve the best you possibly can and that means that you know at least you've succeeded and i think that's an important philosophy to have certainly for me personally is to make sure and something that i've tried to instill in my own children of course your own children probably don't want to listen to you anyway totally agree with that <laughs> Kids never do listen, but they do learn afterwards, don't they? So, yes. <laughs> thank you for that. That um, um, so it, it's it is about building some kind of resilience, isn't it? That that uh, in one sense you need to expect uh, challenges in life, but how you deal with them is is essential uh, and and building that. So, Absolutely. Yeah, and learn from it. You know, it's it's really important to learn from it, to reflect back and learn from every experience you have, positive and negative. Um, so it's important, yes, resilience is really important. So, I mean, if I was to ask you in terms of the pandemic, um, you know, what have been your main challenges and um, how, how have you managed to stay positive and, and productive? Yeah, I think it's not just my challenge. I think everyone's faced very similar challenges, um, some that, may resonate with what I've experienced or, or with others as well. Um, I was fortunate um, before the pandemic um, was able to say to my children, you know, come home. We don't know what's going to happen. It would be nice if we're together rather than separate. So we were together as a family. And I think, and especially for the South Asian community, family is so important. And that either that kind of, you know, um, the small small nucleus or the extended family is really, really important. So that's helped me a lot. Plus work, believe it or not. The time has been challenging because you haven't been able, I haven't been able to see people face to face, meet them, 
but um, technology has been fantastic. So in order to even join DMU, I've met more people online than I would have met had I been on campus. Um, and it's nice to be on campus as well. So that's been useful. Um, and of course, um, time out, you know, time out to sit, reflect. Um, anything that you enjoy is really important. And um, whether it's knitting, so I took up knitting and I, my daughter took up knitting, which is really good. So um, I was able to do that. Um, anything, anything that takes your mind off what you're, you know, the immediate pressures that you have has been really important. So any, I think mindfulness activities overall, whatever that is, should it be um, writing, should it be cooking, anything, you know, um, mm -hmm. maybe, has helped me tremendously. Mm -hmm. And I think there's been a lot of that going on uh, where it's possible on Zoom. I've noticed that there's just so much going on. And we will hear from uh, some other, um, you know, people that are coming on, on, on this event. So hopefully we'll, uh, you may be able to hear some new areas that you can maybe get involved in. So, um, so here's, a, here's a big one. Uh, how do you see social change happening in the new normal? And that what would your priorities be as a university, uh, you know, would be in, in that respect? I think as a university, the priority is to, um, to have as much of a community feel as we possibly can. Um, if you look at our current students missing two academic years, so, you know, the, the COVID has impacted two academic years. And so that's been challenging for our students. Um, so some have benefited from being away from campus because they can study uh, remotely, others haven't. Um, we've got lots of students, um, international students, who've had to cope with time difference, we've had to cope, and even home students, all our students, you know, access to resources, etc. So I think that um, I'm hoping that has given them resilience and actually the uh, kind of unexpected advantage, yeah, advantage, I could say, uh, of the pandemic has been that people have been able to develop new t digital skills and that's been really important so for me bringing people back onto campus of staff and students where possible um, having that sense of community again is really important um, and giving them the skills that they may not have been able to utilize the facilities the resources that are, that we have we've tried very hard to replicate them um, but of course thing is it's never going to be the same as being on campus mm. and the friendships I mean you know you make mm. friends when you're at university and uh, I know certainly that I've had I have lifelong friends as a result of um, studying so all of that is going to be really important for us. That's it I mean you know the students of today even though they may have missed out and uh, you know had a really difficult time will be talking about 2020 particularly, you know, to their grandchildren as well, you know, um, and hopefully, you know, we'll learn a lot from this about social change, because if anything, I've noticed that there is a general, general um, sort of feeling of kindness and understanding and empathy. And these are the kinds of things that actually last year when we did the Amana Wutsa, we were talking about the South Asian um, heritage bringing forward uh, its ancient ways of things, which are about kindness and empathy. So I'm really pleased to hear what you've just said. So hopefully we'll make we'll work together and make something of it. <laughs> um, so so um, how, how do you see local community working closely with the university? So um, and what scope is there to engage? I think there's every scope for engagement. You, um, I'll give you one example. When I was um, in my previous um, institution, um, and I didn't realize at that time, but um, I was approached by Age UK. And they said, do you realize that we've got a really high population of Chinese um, uh, families living um, in the area? And I hadn't realized. But for them, it was important for, to engage with us. And um, so, um, and they, they were digital, of course, digital skills. You know, when, you, when you're living and you, you, you've got family um, across the world, the, their uh, members, the elderly population, weren't able to speak to family as easily, et cetera. So I set up a, what I called a text tea party. So uh, a techies tea party, actually. 
And um, what I invited everyone to do was um, whoever wanted to attend, happy to come along, had some light refreshments, tea, coffee, cakes, biscuits, sandwiches, and come. If you can't use your mobile phone, that's fine. We'll show you how to do it. So my students and um, staff were able to engage. I had someone who had a photograph of the Olympics and hadn't been able to download it or print it off or anything. And so I was, you know, got a student to do that, was able to demonstrate, um, I've got family in America, was able to show how easy it was to take a device and then just, you know, Skype someone in America or anywhere in the world. And they loved it because they were able to contact and meet um, family. And I think that's what, um, that's the role of the, the, that's the role of the university within the community is to enable things as much as we possibly can and to work in partnership. And I think that's really important because, you know, we are, we are part of that community and we need to be involved a bit more. So anything and everything that's possible um, would love to have engagement. And I think it's really important. That's, that's really lovely to hear that. And, and we certainly at cause, we also know many local groups and organizations that are very keen to engage. And, uh, you know, we, we have um, been developing ideas which uh, we've started to share. And uh, I mean, at that point, I'd love to bring in um, Dr. Indrani Lahiri, who has been instrumental in developing COS, actually. She's one, she's um, uh, kindly agreed to be a, an academic consultant for us as well. So she's uh, a director now as well. And we're looking forward to developing ideas because, as you mentioned, you know, in the other area, there were uh, a high um, uh, level of uh, Chinese population. And here, of, of course, in Leicester, I, I believe that in the census 2021, you know, the results are likely to show that there's over 50% BME population, of which a vast majority, and we're talking over 35 to 40%. Is South Asian, um, so you know there's a there's a lot of scope for development here. So thank you ever so much for your time. Thank you, I, I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Um, thank you. Thanks. Um, I shall now uh, move on to um, uh, Indrani Lahiri, who is uh, just a very short uh, uh, introduction for now, because uh, hopefully Indrani will be. Uh, mentioning a lot of things over the whole of this session, I hope, because we are co-hosting as well, uh, but also just a little bit about um, Indrani. She's um, a senior lecturer at the DMU and she's a founder of Mana Watsa today's event. Um, so Indrani, could you give us a little bit about, you know, how you've come about to and your journey very in, in about three minutes? <laughs> If it's possible. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you very much. And I think, you know, I was not expecting this just now, but I will, I will actually around Mana Woodstuff possibly. Um, so I think that, you know, it, it, it was kind of an experiment that I started last year. So in 2019, if you remember, uh, with the Leicester community and Leicester school and colleges, we kind of worked in um, to, to look at how migrants have been framed in newspapers and the kind of narrative um, uh, that's been also out there. However, there was a, a, a kind of tension um, and that was actually not helping the communities to engage with the schools properly and, and all of that. So we kind of tried to look into the media narrative, but we did interviews with some of the secondary and primary schools. And that's where it all started. It was an internally funded project that I did. And out of that came out, of course, in the middle of the pandemic, we were trying to see how we can connect in a broader aspect and, and, and apply for larger bids and all of that. However, um, because of the pandemic, we couldn't. And then we we um, saw that there is something um, that needs to be done because children are at home, parents are uh, struggling to cope with the children. And we quickly um, started the digital platform uh, called the Children's Stories in Times of Corona. And we found interesting things and how parents engaged and how basically uh, people who are working, you know, the NHS um, doctors and nurses, they found it quite relieving when they were coming back to home and then spending some quality time with their children, but actually just exploring drawing. And I think what was major there was actually experimenting with the colors and really using your both hands 
uh, with your children in a confined space where when you can't actually go into the park. And as we were doing that, then I found out from a uh, from an article because I engaged with the post UK the Parliament team uh, for research engagement, and that's where I found out that there is something called the South Asian Heritage Month that was accepted in 2017 but never came up. And and of course, then I started quickly thinking about okay, can we actually do something to come together? And it was very much around the creative. Um, you know, creative practices that we wanted to look at last year. So we said that it's it's more about community resilience, how we can use our creative arts and practices um, to build the community resilience through digital platforms, because my, my research background is in digital media and society. So I partly work in the social psychology part of it, but at the same time, I am trying to bring in the social psychology with the digital anthropology, and that's the subject area that's the interplay or intersection that I'm trying to catch. And that's where uh, Manavut stuff came in. And uh, yeah, and ever since then, you have all joined and you have supported. Uh, and as I've always said, that my journey is never mine. It has been always people's journey because uh, I'm that kind of person. You know, I always love working with people. And somehow I get connected, you know, and then I flow with them. And, and, and that's, that's the flow I'm in at the moment. And we named it, this is the second year, and we have named it um, uh, Community Empowerment. So we said it's not just about the creative practices, but also how can we transfer those creative practices to the community and build ourselves better, you know, in a post pandemic world. So, yeah, apologies if I've taken more than three minutes, but I've tried to. Yes. I think, I think, no, thank you for that. No, I think it's very important to to give a, uh, because not many people have heard about South Asian Heritage Month, never mind Mana Wutsa, which is still only starting off. So thank you for that. We will go deeper into it as we go along. But I suspect today we don't have enough time for covering all the all the issues. Uh, we were delayed as well. Um, and all, you know, best laid plans are always <laughs> tested. So. Um, without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce Iona Mundell. Um, Iona, hi Iona. Hi. Nice to meet you. Me too. I'll just give a little bit. Um, uh, uh, this, uh, I, I could go on for 10 minutes about what you've accomplished at your age and I, am, I take my hat off to you that you have done so much uh, and I'm really proud to be able to introduce you um you know um so, so your name uh is is um you're named after a scottish island which is uh, in the hebrides amazing that's uh, yeah. a lovely start <laughs> um at 15 you're in year 11 and um you've uh, you are a uh, gosh amazing you you have been a member of mensa and uh achieved the highest score 162 um and you you are co-editing the magazine the junior mensa magazine um and you know you've been uh birmingham young poet laureate finalist 2018 and one of 100 foil young poets uh globally for 2020 um so just for the audience iona's poems have won prestigious accolades during the David Shepherd Wildlife Foundation Global Poetry Competition in 2014, um, and the Elmer Trust Ted Hughes Young Poet Award 2016, and the Jacqueline Wilson Creative Writing Prize 2018. Um, and there's, I could go on for ages uh, with the number of uh, areas that you've worked in, but um, I, I'm, I'll tell you what we will, um, just go straight into, I believe you have uh, a poem that you're going to read for us. Would you do that for me? Thank you. Of course. Um, before I do my poem, though, um, I'd just like to say it's a huge honour to be invited to this event, um, especially because I'm being branded as a South Asian influencer, and I don't believe I really live up to that status, yeah. especially yeah. with the amazing panel here. But yeah, I, I'm incredibly excited to be here, and with no further ado, um, I'd like to read my first poem, which is titled Quiet Flows the River. 
Um, I actually wrote this as a kind of testimony to the pride I have for my roots and my heritage. And it sort of takes that idea on in a more physical and geographical way. Because I remember in 2018, when I last visited India, um, I was actually standing at the banks of the Mahananda River and looking over at the border where, where Bangladesh stands. Um, I was standing on in, uh, in, uh, in India, but Bangladesh was on the other side. And that was just incredibly mesmerizing to me because I could literally see cows and people walking past. And yet that was a whole new country. Mm. Um, yeah, so that was just an, an image which has been imprinted in my mind ever since then and is a reason why I chose to write this book. I stand at the border of two time zones, a river separating two nations, half an hour lost in the gap of time. The river flows quiet as if to console, bathing in its waters an enmeshed culture, a language submerged in tears. Ripples pattern the water between water hyacinths and lotuses bordering the banks. A fish swims past effortlessly, knowing not where it is from nor where it goes, but that it is present this moment. On the other side, I hear the muezzin's call for evening prayer. On this side, the smell of incense diffuses to the sound of blowing conch shells. I pause for a while to listen. Children sit on the cold floor of an old temple courtyard, chanting poetry in rhythmic unison their teacher supervises. The sentry stands at a distance under a thatched check post, rifle in hand, he oversees. Tomorrow is Independence Day. Wow, that's, that's um, so deep for a 15 year old. It's, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you're wise beyond your years, honestly. <laughs> yeah, um, I remember visiting the place um, on actually the 14th of August. So the poem is actually very accurate in saying that tomorrow is Independence Day. And especially, I think it also links to the India-Bangladesh partition. Um, a lot of my family comes from Bangladesh too. So I do have a connection to it, even though I've never actually visited. So just being able to see that country from a short distance was something which I could hardly fathom and that really inspired me. That's amazing, thank you. Uh, we'll bring you back in for another, uh, I'm not too sure whether you're able to stay for the full full uh, event, uh, are you okay? I am yeah, back in okay. later? Mm -hmm. yeah. I will definitely bring you back in because I know you've got more poems to read. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, okay, thank you very much. Um, now I'd just like to um, uh, show you a video uh, uh, that um, a young lady called Inam has um, uh, sent for us. Unfortunately, she couldn't join us today. Um, and um, I, I think this one is the one relating to her school experience, um, either that one or the Goal 16. So uh, let's just hear which one it is and then we'll, I'll come back. I would like to thank Manav Utsav and celebrating our similarities for organising this event. Um, the National Awareness Month promotes British South Asian heritage and history through education, arts, culture and commemoration with the goal of helping people to better understand the diversity of present day Britain. This has become more important than ever and this commemoratory month creates a massive stepping stone for our journey to eliminate the stigma and shame that surrounds the embracing of one's own South Asian heritage when in a foreign environment, especially among the Asian British youth. In my lifetime, I've gone from school to school, therefore changing friends every couple of years, 
However, one thing I notice that doesn't seem to change is the confusion among young brown friends, of my young brown friends, regarding who they are. We've all seemed to have gotten lost in the illusion of who we think society wants us to be and who we actually are. Day after day, I have witnessed my friends shy away and hide who they are. May that be being too embarrassed to bring that gulab jamun or jalebi or whatever food it is from their culture to school to avoid being the odd one out or feeling too self-conscious to publicly speak their language of their country of origin in fear someone will know they're Indian and it truly does break my heart. I had a friend in school who would mispronounce Hindi words purposefully when in public despite her fluency in the language to fit in with the rest of the English kids. Even though she spoke the best Hindi you'd ever hear with the rest of us Asian kids, it was self-suppression. This causes a chain reaction of shame as in an environment where everybody is shying away from who they really are, nobody will be able to discover themselves and embrace themselves. From a young age, we've been taught to blend into the crowd, otherwise the consequence will be judgment and disapproval. This way of thinking among young people limits self-expression and self-acceptance. However, this celebratory month helps to change that, therefore proving its importance to not only the South Asian community, but all people in general and contributes to our goal of creating a less judgmental world for ourselves and others. This presents us with a great opportunity to be more representative of our diverse communities and to help people understand partition and embrace the beauty of the culture and history by improving the social cohesion across the country. Thank you. <laughs> What an amazing insight. Um, to be honest, I was shocked to, re to hear that um, and see that video because I thought that was during my time and I won't tell you how long ago what that was, but that, it, that, that time of feeling like you're the other uh, had gone. But uh, this is a young uh, teenager uh, who's, who's expressing that. So you know this these are the kinds of issues that we do need to um address but also acknowledge that they do exist um so moving on um i'd like to introduce professor nandini chakrabarti um hello there hi good evening good evening absolutely um, I, I could uh, read, again, a really long list of your biography, uh, but I'm going to let you do the talking before but before I pass it on to you. Uh, just, to, just to say, um, Professor Nandini Chakrabarti is uh, an NHS con uh, consultant and a psychiatrist. Um, she has a, an honorary professor at the University of Leicester. She's an associate dean for equivalence. Um, the Royal College of Psych Psychiatrists, Secretary on the International SCAM Panel. Um, she's worked in various locations, which I'm sure you'll talk about in the next few minutes. Um, she's amazing um, uh, training that she's given. I've certainly been uh, privileged to uh, attend uh, uh, World Health Organization Mental Health Gap Training, which I you know, can highly recommend anybody who gets the opportunity uh, um you know i don't know if nandini can cover everyone but you know, uh, it, it was very very beneficial and i think it's going to be needed but without going into all of that i can suggest to people you look up nandini's profile as with iona as well uh, they're amazing people and I, I feel very proud to introduce you as well so over to you give me a little bit about your journey uh, in the next four minutes, say. Thank you, Kamalaji. Thank you for those very kind words. So when I came to the UK from India in 2003, my goals were to pass my psychiatry exams, become a consultant psychiatrist, see my daughter grow up, save money, travel, buy a house, the standard dreams 
but I don't think I dreamt further. Life has taken me on a very different journey and I have ended up in a place I would have never imagined when I started out. Today, in addition to being a consultant psychiatrist, I hold important responsibilities with the Royal College of Psychiatrists, GMC, Health Education England, and I have teaching and training roles nationally and internationally. I am passionate about solo female travel on the side. I have traveled outside the beaten track. But what I want to bring to this session today is not just about my journey, but some of my reflections. After I passed my Royal College exams, I settled down comfortably for a bit in a staff grade job, nine to five, permanent contract, no on calls. But six months in, I found myself desperately unhappy and feeling stuck, no career progression. And I got a higher training job. And I remember the shock in my parents' voice when I broke the news. Why would you leave a permanent job with no on-calls? This is the perfect job for a woman. And it suddenly sank in. Even as a doctor, there are jobs which are good for women because women are expected to balance roles inside the house and outside. Whatever you do, your core responsibility sits at home and hearth. A couple of years ago, a high profile rape case rocked India. There were videos circulating on WhatsApp. One of them had a script which said, respect women because they are somebody's daughter, mother, sister, wife, girlfriend. And I thought that the people who were making these videos did not get the core essence of what constitutes dignity for a woman. A woman deserves to be treated with dignity because she is a human being with rights, a mind, a will of her own. Her relationships are not her identity and her right to respect. But even today, a successful man can be all career, but a woman is expected to balance career with kitchen. And we all expect it, uh, expect it consciously or unconsciously, even women do. We have been taught to give ourselves so much that we forget to dream for ourselves. We feel guilty about dreaming for ourselves. So with all that life has taught me, I've also had to unlearn a lot of things about what constitutes a good woman. The downcast eyes, the low voice, the gentleness and uh, putting the needs of others before yourself all the time. Women's empowerment in South Asian communities here or back home in India needs to focus on the development of identity, I strongly feel. It's not just education, jobs, preventing violence, unless we are aware of the patriarchal system within our communities and are ready to fight it, gender inequality is going to re remain a distant dream. So that's sharing some of my thoughts with uh, you folks uh, this evening, Kamla. Wow, wow, that's amazing. I mean, we will open the discussion. I'd like to bring some of the things that you've mentioned into the conversation when we uh, go in later on into an open discussion. But um, just two thoughts. Last year, we did do a little bit on uh, South Asian communities addressing issues and subjects that we don't normally um, mention, talk about, want to address or, or that kind of thing. We were talking about, you know, domestic violence and uh, mental health. Uh, they, they are the kind of subjects that used to be uh, relevant for but diabetes. People wouldn't admit to diabetes before, but now that's common. And, and we've reached that stage where we need to talk about mental health and domestic violence and all of those other issues that you're, you're mentioning about dreams and, and being able to dream and uh, succeed. And, and the other point I wanted to mention was that I did some research uh, about um, you know, professors in the UK. And in 2020, I found that out of the 23,000 something professors in the UK, 
seven uh, percent were of uh, Asian origin, uh, and only 0.5, if not under that, were black. 0.5 uh, percent. That's the amazing, uh, amazingly low figure, um, and that. Um, you know, women within that context were only the total, you know, or, or of all races were only about 3,000 out of the 23,000. And then I calculated, and this is my estimation, but I estimate that they may be around 60 to 70 Asian female professors in the UK. And today we have had engagement from three of them, and that constitutes 5% of the UK's professors. And I feel proud that we've managed to get you three on. You know, Professor Sushma Patel, yourself, fingers. Professor uh, Monica Lechenpol from UCL, who hasn't been able to attend today, unfortunately, but she has sent a video which is very relevant for our community as well. So, but thank you very much. And I'll move on for now, but I'll bring you back. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Um, now I'd like to introduce uh, Shilpa Arya. Um, hi, hi, Shilpa. Hi. How are you? I'm very well. How are you? Great. Thank you. I'm fine. Shilpa, Shilpa is an HR consultant. Um, recently, she has now become uh, uh, an activist and a campaigner for Unheard Voices. And actually, relating to some of the things which I just mentioned with uh, Nandini, was uh, around, um, you know, mental health and domestic violence. And perhaps, Shilpa, if you could give me your journey uh, of what you're doing now and uh, your passion. Sure. So, um, as I say, uh, I suppose if I start with my passion, which is um, being a voice for um, Unheard Voices and a campaigner for Unheard Voices, um, I'm not from an academic background at all, um, so I'm very humbled to be in the presence of all the academics, but I hope I can add something different to the mix in terms of, um, you know, the, the importance of actually listening to um, communities and listening to those that uh, uh, perhaps don't get heard because they don't come from an academic or uh, professional background from our communities. Um, in terms of my background, I've had over 30 years in local government and uh, uh, worked in HR, as you say, um, and uh, spent a lot of time working um, around equality, diversity and inclusion um, as kind of being my um, key areas of interest, I guess, in some ways. Um, I've also um, worked um, within the voluntary sector. So um, worked um, with the Royal Voluntary Service and also Oxfam to large charities over, over the last few years. Uh, and more recently, I worked at um, Nottingham Trent University. Um, and um, after spending all this time in, in organisations, I kind of made a decision that I didn't want to work within institutions because I felt that it was very difficult to kind of bring about change. Um, so I now kind of, as, I, as, as you've said, uh, work as a campaigner and an activist. Um, I've been working with yourself, Cos, uh, and we recently did an event around domestic violence, which I think was received very well. And we've got a follow up event, um, which I hope will bring out, bring about um, social change within Leicester, Leicestershire and Rutland. Um, I'm also working um, on another grassroots project in Nottingham which is around vaccine hesitancy. And as you'll be aware, um, you know, the um, COVID-19 has had a um, disproportionate impact on um, vain communities in terms of, um, in terms of um, um, hospitalizations, but also in terms of deaths as well, uh, and including within, within the health profession. Um, so I feel that, you know, that vaccine hesitancy project is important because there is this issue of mistrust around vaccines um, and it's important, I think, to try and listen to people and understand why there is that hesitancy um, and to try and work with uh, public sector organisations and academic institutions to, kind of, I suppose, bridge that, bridge that gap 
so that we can encourage more people to take up vaccines um, and to address that historical um, systemic issue of, um, of um, inequality and disparity that we have um, in, in all areas. Um, so that whether that's in education, whether that's in health, whether that's in, in terms of receiving services or even funding. So those are the areas that are kind of, I guess, important for me. Um, I think over the last year, um, during the pandemic, what I found is that um, I have I've experienced personal loss. Um, so I lost my um, cousin to COVID-19. He was younger than me um, and um, I felt um, very impacted by that because I had not had the opportunity to meet him yet. Um, so it was one of my things that I wanted to do, um, but um, sadly we lost him last year. But also being from um, within the community, we have a um, system of kind of notifying um, people of, of, of bereavements within the community. And uh, I was just um, taken aback by the number of um, emails that I was getting of loss within within my community and, and I felt very, very affected by that. Um, I have three children and um, mm -hmm. you know they they've been impacted by um, the events of the last um, 18 months or so. Um, my mm -hmm. youngest daughter has had um, you know estimated um, GCSE results. My daughter in Nottingham has had long period without seeing her family. Um, so yeah, those have been real challenges, I think, over the last 18 months or so. So um, I'm really pleased to be involved in this. I'm not sure that I, uh, I, form, I would qualify as a South Asian influencer. I was born in Uganda and came here in, um, in uh, uh, 72 um, and actually have never been to India. So, <laughs> but I, I feel, you know, that um, maybe I'm an honorary South Asian influencer. No, I would say you are an influencer, South Asian origin, but um, in terms of your um, input into the local community, this is, um, you know, the impact that you're making, particularly within the um, voluntary sector. I believe um, that this is why I felt that you are an influencer. And of course, I should have mentioned, uh, Shilpa is actually uh, an advisor on cause, uh, which I failed to mention earlier for some reason. But yes, um, she, she's been doing some sterling work on getting um, the institutions around the table on looking at, um, <clears throat> well, uh, currently mental health and domestic violence uh, within the South Asian communities. Um, so, yeah, no, I'm, I'm really hopeful about um, practical action to make change happen. So, great. Thank you very much, Shilpa. I'll bring you back in the open conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, now we shall just play a video on um, cultural intelligence, a very powerful um, area that needs to be, it's very uh, relevant for today's time, uh, from Marsha Ramroop. Marsha Ramroop is a good friend um, and she's just, uh, I'm really proud uh, that she's, she's become the very first um, director of um, diversity and inclusion in his in the history of the Royal Institute of British Architects, uh, but she's also a trainer, and she she, she trained quite heavily on uh, cultural intelligence, which is her sort of passion. So, uh, if we could play that video, please. Hello, my name is Marsha Ramroop. I'm the director of inclusion at the Royal Institute of British Architects, and I am also a CQ. Uh, that's cultural intelligence uh, facilitator and trainer and I'm going to spend a couple of minutes just telling you about CQ and why it's important to you um, as well as to anybody else because um, just because we come from a particular group doesn't mean that we're predisposed to um, be preferential to that group. That is to say, just because I'm brown doesn't mean that I can't have racist behaviours and, um, and actions. And I think that it's really important for all of us to recognise that 
when we're socialized into a particular environment, the likelihood is, is that we have bias. So growing up in the UK, I have been socialized uh, and politicized and my economic perspectives are all based around this society in which I've grown up in. And so all of those bits of information have fed into my very being and feed into my decision making in a way that I don't even realise. Our bias is rooted in the fact that we have 11 million bits of information going into our brain at biological need to shortcut information. And all the sort of uh, images and messages and uh, lots of different things that have gone into us becoming who we are today is as a result of our environment. And so you should assume that you are a biased individual. Indeed, you are. And so what you need to do is to create processes and procedures that allow you to mitigate that bias. You cannot change it. You can only put in procedures at this time to help mitigate it. So what does that mitigation look like? And that is what cultural intelligence is. It's that mitigation piece. So cultural intelligence, CQ, Q stands for quotient because it's a measure as well as a skill. You can take an assessment and be measured on how high your CQ is. But CQ, cultural intelligence, is the capability to work and relate effectively with people who are different from you. That is uh, the difference between success and failure with people who are different from you is how high your cultural intelligence is. And cultural intelligence is broken down into four capabilities. The first is CQ drive. Do you want to? Do you, are you motivated to work and relate effectively with those who are different from you? And if you're not, how do you motivate yourself? And do you have the confidence to go into interactions with those who are different from you? And when they go wrong, do you have the confidence to pick yourself up, dust yourself down and give it another go? The second capability is CQ knowledge. So that's what do you know? What are you thinking about? What are your own values? How do they compare to somebody else's? How do you bridge the gap when someone else's values seem so different to yours, so alien that you think they're wrong and you're right? But it isn't that you're wrong and you're on their right or vice versa. It's just a different perspective. What's acceptable and familiar to me may not be acceptable and familiar to you. That doesn't mean that either of you are necessarily right or wrong. It can just be a different perspective. The third, and the, that's the reason why the CQ knowledge piece is so, so huge, because you can never know any everything about everyone. And so that's why it's so important to surround yourself with a diversity of lived experience. There's much other input into your own life as possible. The third piece of the puzzle is CQ strategy and this is uh, thinking about what you're thinking about. It's a unique human ability to do that metacognition piece. So if you're motivated and you have some knowledge and you go straight into action without CQ strategy you're likely to act in a stereotypical and tokenistic way. So you need CQ strategy which is about planning which is about being hugely self-aware, which is about checking your assumptions. Because uh, if you go straight into it, like I say, without doing that piece of work, what I consider one of the most important pieces of work, you're likely to be stereotypical. And then finally, the fourth piece, the fourth capability, CQ action. Ultimately, people judge us on our behaviours and those who are high in CQ action have a broad repertoire of behaviours on which to call upon to adapt in an authentic way in order to be effective at working and relating with those who are different from you. Now, these four capabilities, uh, it's an ongoing journey to improve oneself 
and ask the question, what is it about me? Which means that I find it difficult to work with you. So it doesn't matter whether we're looking at race, age, sexuality, uh, gender, um, disability, whatever the situation is. You then have a framework of behaviours in which to build upon and mitigate your bias by listening, learning, reflecting and acting in a way that means you'd be more effective at working and relating with those who are different from you. And that is cultural intelligence. I'm, I, every time I hear it, I, I understand more and more. And I, what I would suggest to you is that this video will be available to catch up on. Um, and I would suggest you hear that again. Um, and it does tell you a lot about, you know, us as individuals and uh, what we can do to make change happen. Um, in relation to, you know, uh, making change happen, uh, I'd like to introduce um, Rasila Sarda. Um, hi, Rasila, you're muted at the moment. Hi, Rasila. Hi. 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 Yeah, I'm fine, thank you. Um, Rasila is an um, a environmental health um, professional and she's been quite heavily involved in um, COVID um, response uh, in relation to safety. And she's been traveling in Europe. Um, and for me, I think that's an amazing um, area for a South Asian woman to be delivering in these current times. And uh, I'd like to hear a little bit more about your journey without going into the detail of uh, your profile. People can look it up and uh, due to the time that we have, I'd rather hear you say something. Okay. Um, thank you. First of all, thanks for inviting me. I, I do feel quite honoured, especially uh, with all these, you know, prestigious ladies with, uh, you know, highly academic ladies. So thank you for inviting me. Yes, yeah, so I'm a, um, I started my uh, work in environmental health, uh, so I'm a chartered environmental health practitioner now. I'm also a safety consultant and safety coach. So my passion was to um, train people and I loved training and my intent when I went into this career was to actually um, help people to keep them safe from harm when they're working. And my intention still is to sort of help people, but my scope is wider now. And I have moved more into a more of a coaching role and looking more into behaviors. So um, sort of picking up a little bit of what uh, Marta was saying earlier as well. Mm. So what, what um, I'm looking more into with the coaching side is um, behaviours. Why do we behave the way we behave? And as human beings, just to try and underpin, uh, look at what underpins our behaviour, it's almost like an iceberg. So we have deep-rooted sort of conditioning and on top of that we've got our layers of beliefs and value systems that are you know again quite deep rooted and it goes back to when you're young and um influence from you know your parents and uh, your peers and, mm. and so forth and then our attitude which is how we choose to respond to certain situations a given situation and how we're feeling at the time so that will all affect our behaviors and I was very fortunate with the pandemic and it was a very difficult time. Um, but I have um, had this opportunity to go to Belgium to work on a construction site uh, where, as you may be aware, construction is a very high risk industry and there can be a, a number of fatalities. So instead of just doing the, the normal health and safety training um, this is a different approach I work with a company called Setters 
and the approach is more on behavioural safety. And what we do is coach people and show them where our behaviours come from, what underpins our behaviour and what we're actually taking in. A lot of our behaviours stem from our subconscious. And it was a bit of what Martha covered that generally over 99% of our behaviours are driven by our subconscious. So what we do consciously is very a small percentage. Because whatever we're doing, we form a habit. And mm. our internal, um, our brain says, right, I will write you a program on that. And that goes into our subconscious. And that is driven. And that is what mm. forms our reality. And mm. what forms our perceptions. And this is very wide ranging. So it can be in a work environment. So when I was out um, in Belgium, it was um, a very different environment. And I can actually say that I was, there was only two people from the BME group. So mm. that was me uh, and another lady, a black lady, but she was more um, on the, the project team. Mm. So from a safety mm. side, uh, I think it's it's not um, really an industry or a career that many no. of um, yeah um, right. especially Asian uh, and women that go into there are more women going into it now, but especially mm. when I sort of started off. But I think mm. coaching is the way forward because training is brilliant, but it has its limitations unless you put that training into practice. And it's fantastic if you go away and you, you practice what you've learned day in, day out, it becomes a habit and then it becomes a subconscious behaviour, what we would call our natural behaviours. But when that doesn't happen, we we need to um, you know, try and tap into that. Sorry, you were saying. So, so I suppose um, <clears throat> the current training that, that you're giving uh, in terms of COVID, that can be um, a long-standing approach to safety as well, you know. Um, yes, it can, because if, if mm. people understand, I think a lot of the times with training or information or instruction, people feel that we're just telling them what to do. And obviously my enforcement background, that was my role. It was more mm. of a policing role that you need to do this, otherwise there'll be consequences. So mm. just moving from that sort of, area mm. to the other side of the spectrum where you're actually providing in you know, a bit more mentoring and coaching you're getting people to understand why they behave the way they behave mm. and the reason for the safety controls mm. so mm. they understand then right i need to in, in terms of mm. covid that they need to have the social distance or wear mm. a mask or you know have the appropriate cleaning in place because um it could mm cause them harm or what we found with this is potentially it can actually harm somebody they love that mm. is a lot more vulnerable than them mm. and, and i think um, in the current climate people are more um you know willing to listen because of what they see as well um but i mean in terms of um, um your nlp and your other coaching area we'll come back to that conversation um, okay. i think that's the area you want to work on um we'll move on uh because time is actually yeah, zooming sure. out, so thank but thank you thank you for coming it was really a pleasure to see you there right uh now i think we have we have a, a really creative person that i've worked with in uh, last year during the mana of event uh, i'd like to introduce you all to ramanjit kaur from the creative arts uh, Academy from Kolkata. Thank you, Ramanjit, for joining Thank us. Thank you so much, Gamla, for inviting. Oh, it's lovely, lovely to see you. Uh, it's I think nearly a year since I last saw you. Um, yes. Uh, how good. are you, and uh, how has your journey been? And uh, uh, give us a little bit about how how you. I know you work in the UK as well, so give us a little bit of your story. Well, uh, UK has been uh, a second home, but coming back to the story of, you know, what the webinar or your 
conference is all about quiet flows the river you know it and it's kind of uh, and it is about women empowerment that you want to talk about and it really i i love the title because it resonates that how quietly and patiently women folk all over the world we just take in so much onto ourselves whether it's physically mentally emotionally and that's where the whole journey starts i as an as a performer or um, a director my journey has always been concerned about uh, you know what is this conflict that we feel within ourselves the journey within what is the conflict that we feel with our is relationships where does it come from Why, how can it be resolved so uh, taking my work as a performer where we've done many classics from all over the world with uh, the woman as the protagonist and uh, delving deep into the relationships because whether it's a professional relationship or a personal relationship or social relationship that's where you kind of measure where we are you know what is our status what is my position in this relationship so um i think uh, years of work um as a performer also got me into working with a uh, women's troupe uh since 2011 as part of the creative arts uh, journey the creative arts was um founded in 2002 so um when 2011 we started this kamla and to all our panelists here i would like to share uh, i'm living in kolkata and this is 21st century kolkata and we're talking about educated uh, women and uh, when i saw the scenario in so called privileged homes i realized that uh, the educated class or so called privileged class was actually uh, very not underprivileged but unprivileged class because they actually didn't have any voices there was money and more money there was a uh, lesser voice there was because you came you were from a richer family you were, you come from an affluential family so your voice gets more and more diminished because uh, you come from a family that everyone knows or talks about how can you do something different how can you have a voice that doesn't go with the family image how can you have an emotion that doesn't uh, say that everything is good so you wear your red lipstick in the evening and you just say everything is fine so that's where quiet flows the river whatever goes is within those four walls no one ever knows but let me share with my Uh, counterparts in uk and this is something that i later on realized goes on throughout the world uh, you know one has collaborated with artists in uk in uh, usa um, france and uh, everywhere we talk about it the situation of the women is quite similar we may feel that a certain section or certain part of the world is uh, modern or they have uh, broken the shackles but uh, inside that is still not the case so uh, what happens to these voices or what are the shackles that they are tied in the issues that they are dealing with is uh, uh, domestic violence emotional and physical uh, dowry prostitution and uh, i mean you you just name it and you have it so uh, what happened to this group of women who joined theater is we realized that in the safe space of theater we could share our stories with each other we could um, really um, bring out what was uh, what concerned us or what were these uh, deep down issues that we had or we had suppressed uh, within us and that's what was bothering us or sometimes we were not allowing uh, us to come out as a person we were behaving as someone else who we were not but over these years of um, nine long years of work and delving deep and doing so many productions it has really done metamorphosis change in this community of women in kolkata but how does it affect others how will it affect someone sitting in uk i feel that everything is a ripple effect because they themselves have 
found this change and they become a ripple effect for the community that they are touching. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's that kind of ripple effect that we look at. Recently, we've collaborated with Paula McFetridge from Northern Ireland uh, in UK, just like we collaborated with Mana Utsav. This is just a little bit longer and deeper project, uh, British Council commissioned, where both the groups in two different countries are looking at uh, borders. What are these borders of nation, caste, color, gender, mind, and body? And uh, what is this gender violence? What are the conflicts that we face? So um, basically, I think that's what my work involves. One is delving deep into it, uh, helping people reach a cathartic moment through theater exercises and even films where we share what uh, concerns us, just like you saw in that one week of workshop that all of us did, that we, we just shared what was there in our mind and it ended up in a production. We actually performed it and we had only met for those uh, that one week or 10 days. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, I guess that's what theater does, bringing out a catharsis and sharing your story. And I think just in that sharing, uh, recently, Paula's work, Shedding of the Skin, was just, you know, there's another woman inside me. There's another woman. There are 100 women inside me. So it was all about the stories that we are carrying inside us. And the mm. moment we kind of share them, healing starts happening from there. And mm. uh, I think uh, over here, I will uh, rest. Uh, it might uh, be. Absolutely. Okay. That's so beautiful. I think such a deep deep understanding of the, the um, situation of woman in this 21st century. Uh, you know, you really summed it up so well. Thank you so much for that. And I so look forward to opportunities to work with you as we move forward. Um, yes, we look forward to. Indrani had invited me recently, but that week, unfortunately, I could only spare one day. I didn't have one week to give because we we just culminating this uh, festival which is going on international arts festival for the young and in fact all of you here if you know youngsters young people children who uh, would like to attend parents educators the festival is on you must attend and that was the reason i couldn't be with indrani and demon foot university for a workshop mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. thank you uh, uh kamladi for organizing this all the very best for your endeavors. Really thank you commend so much. Thank you for coming. Commend thank thank you. Will. Yeah, hopefully yeah. we'll have some time for discussion. I think we will have to go over our time. So those that can stay I'm on. I'm going to drop out so that if Rani can come in and uh, we will continue our discussions in the coming yes. times. Of course. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm now going to try and um, because of the timing, I'm going to see if we are able to go for an extra half an hour for those that are able to stay with us for that discussion. Uh, but we've got um, uh, Zintia Ganesh Panchan and Taranjit uh, Kaur, who are both uh, very um, similar activists within two different continents, I think, but they have links with the UK and India, uh, respectively. So, I feel, uh, I hope you don't mind me bringing you both on at the same time. Uh, Taranjit, you're, you're muted, by the way. So um, I'll just, I'll introduce Cynthia. Hi, Cynthia. Hello. Hi. Cynthia Hello. is a, a very well-known local um, CEO of a charity organization. And I hear about her work in so many different platforms. Um, so I'm really proud to have, have her on board. Um, I'm sure she'll tell us all about what, what she does. Um, and uh, I've got Taranjit Kaur now. We've not met Taranjit Kaur before, but Hi. I have heard of her. Hi. And, and I believe that you are both uh, very heavily involved in uh, the, the current issue around period poverty um, and how sanitation issues affect women. Uh, and, um, you know, if I, if I start off with Zintia, then maybe Taranjit, you could then see what you're doing in India and how you can perhaps maybe even collaborate. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So if, if we if we say we, we give this uh, five minutes in total and then we can take the conversation further later. Yeah. yeah. So thank you, Kamala, for inviting me. Uh, 
the Cynthia Trust uh, is uh, set up to support women and girls to be free from poverty and abuse. And we work in Leicester and Leicestershire at the moment because increasingly, uh, uh, pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, we have seen the status of women and girls, uh, uh, South Asian backgrounds or other Asian backgrounds. I mean, they've been suffering through various uh, forms of abuse, uh, poverty, and uh, other forms of disadvantages, including period poverty that I work on here uh, in the UK, uh, in Leicester. But equally, I also work on issues such as period poverty and domestic violence in Nepal and uh, Sri Lanka, where I am originally from Sri Lanka. So that's what I do in a nutshell here. And trying to, uh, and actually, Taranjit, I mean, I'm interested in listening about this, building those relationships, partnerships, will enable us to support the communities that we work and especially the women and girls that we care so much about better and more effectively. And that is my vision and uh, uh, passion, I would say. Thank you. Sure. Uh, hi, good evening, everybody. It's been wonderful listening to everyone. And um, so I'll just, uh, in one line, summarize what I do. I am from theatre background. I work in films as an actor. And I am an activist um, uh, by passion. Uh, I work, uh, I write and perform poetry uh, for women empowerment. So most of my work in the last few years has been uh, to bring change, positive change in the condition of women of my country and around the world. Uh, so this uh, is around the beginning of the lockdown uh, when a couple of us from the film industry and other artists got together uh, to uh, help people who had lost their jobs. And uh, we were helping them, giving them groceries or any other kind of help they needed. And that's when we discovered that when people, they lost their livelihood and had no money to uh, survive how would the women buy sanitary napkins? So it just started with a very simple thought and we went out distributing sanitary pads. And uh, we just thought that, you know, how much can we give? And we put a simple status on social media asking our friends to help. And within a week, we had received thousands of sanitary pads. And like within one or two months, we were already in 25 uh, cities and now we have 70 uh, volunteers um, who are directly uh, so the organization the initiative is called pad squad and we have 70 volunteers all over the country and thousands of other organizations who are collaborating with us in reaching out to the interiors and different parts of the country we started with giving sanitary napkins and very soon we realized how they are also harming the women and the environment so we also started working towards giving environment friendly uh, solutions uh, like cloth pads menstrual cups and we work uh, intensively towards uh, spreading awareness about menstrual hygiene about health mental and physical health of women mm, i personally focus on working and encouraging our volunteers to adopts uh, specific communities so if i work with one community in mumbai i would continue working with that particular community for one year apart from going to other ngos and other organizations that call us uh, so i think um, in any kind of work that you're doing it's very important to build a relationship and to develop that trust. Uh, so after a point, you know, it becomes like your family. And it's important to, um, you know, kind of dissolve or remove that wall of us and them. You know, every time initially we would say, oh, we're going to help them, we're doing this for them. Unless we don't work towards removing those lines and those walls, it will never be together. It will never be about all of us women together. Uh, so yeah, this is some of the work that uh, we've been doing. Um, there are seven uh, women who got together, who are the founders, and there are 70 others and hundreds of more volunteers who are working every day, uh, spreading awareness, distributing pads and cups. So, I mean, I, I can just see that um, mm. this issue is so essential. And I know that we've, we, I would love to talk more about this. And I hope that you stay over past the seven o'clock, which was when we were going to stop. But I would like this conversation to continue so that you can actually make collaborative 
connection, if that is a possibility. But also yes, just I would love to connect with Zinthia and know how we can collaborate because I think at <laughs> end of the day, we want to reach out to more and more women and if we work together, it would be really wonderful. Yes, I, I will, yeah, I mean, I will be um, offering everyone to exchange emails as well. So. Sure. For the time being, I'm sorry, uh, I'll now have to move on. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, so now I'd like to move on to Raj. Uh, Raj Harrison Gill is, um, sorry, Raj Gill Harrison. I've got it wrong again, haven't I? Apologies. <laughs> um, so Raj is a um, psychologist. Um, she, she has uh, many, many years of experience in so many different areas. She's a consultant, inclusion, equality campaigner. She's founded um, charities, uh, stroke groups and organizations. She's heavily involved with the carers, local carers group. Uh, she's a pioneer and an entrepreneur. And she's also into NLP coaching. Um, She's a certified international public speaker. She's an advocate, educator, uh, resilience and self-growth coach. Um, and a grassroots practitioner has been very, and, and a disabled carer and a single parent. And she's been, even with the, the responsibilities that she had, she's been heavily involved in the COVID response um, as a volunteer. So thank you, Raj, for joining us. Um, really appreciate it in your busy schedule of things as well. <laughs> thank so, you. Thank you, Kamala. It's, it's wonderful to be invited and be amongst all these amazing women as well. I'm so proud of you all. It's, it's fantastic. Good for you. And thank you for everything you're all doing as well. Um, uh, women you. make things happen. We get it done, don't we? <laughs> Absolutely. But give me a little, uh, two or three minutes of your background and give me your journey. Uh, I'm okay. sorry about the timing, but uh, th th that's where we are at the moment. But hopefully, if you stay on, we will get more discussion opened up. Yep. Um, I suppose my background, I was born in London. Uh, my early years, I was brought up in Kenya um, with my parents. Mum was a teacher. My dad was a businessman. Then we came over here early to mid-70s. Um, I went to, went, went to university and with the aim of becoming a, a clinical child psychologist, um, had to drop my PhD um, and come back to look after my mum, who was a single parent, who was very ill. Um, so ended up being a carer for over 40 years, but also developed my career um, working with vulnerable communities, um, but not necessarily in the direction I'd wanted to go. I think Nandini was saying that your dreams take a different path and take you to different ways. Um, but still managed to do my passion, which is about well-being and resilience and working with people, um, you know, helping people help themselves and doing community cohesion and, and all sorts of community and collaborative work, which is what, how I think the world should work. And, and, you know, working together is what helps us look after each other, spending that kindness and strength. Um, and then... You know, got married, got divorced, brought up some amazing children uh, with their own differences, um, all sorts of things like that as life goes on. And throughout that, I've carried on working in the education sector. So I've, I've taught, I've also um, been a strategic leader and planning and being part of the strategic planning of different things that happen through education, voluntary sector, set up some charities, um, and and just literally in in public sector as well. I've worked with health and social care amongst all of that. And then the pandemic hit last year and helped set up the mutual aid groups in the Leicester City area and help coordinate the emergency outreach work there, um, supporting vulnerable and isolated communities. And again, neighbours helping neighbours, bringing people together, developing relationships, enabling people to look after their own well-being as well as supporting other people. As a result of that, um, having been a carer myself for over 40 years as I've said and not necessarily realizing that I'd been a carer for that many years as a child as well I saw more and more the plight of all these restrictions last year with the unpaid caregivers um, obviously majority of caregivers are women so this is quite pertinent in terms of the work that we all here do particularly focusing on women and it includes all the different issues you know there's that violence which can be through dementia it can be through mental health all sorts of different types of the definitions of abuse and violence that any of us know, you know, it's not just physical. 
so that that's something that is very key so I've, I've sort of my passion has become about working specifically with people who are coming through very if events of adversity and unexpected life changes and trauma um, and particularly caregivers from right at the beginning of their journey right through to the end but also beyond whether it's grief living grief bereavement loss loss of identity loss of relationship loss of anything you can care and, and just how people deal with their own self-care because women particularly and on top of that with that intersectionality you've got other things that come into it like being a caregiver you don't have that self-care you know we have very incredible resilience um, and through my coaching and consulting I'm trying to um, when I'm working with families I'm working with carers I'm working with professionals and I'm also campaigning really to just bring about equality and inclusion because caregivers get forgotten we want employment rights i would love to see us as a, a protected characteristic because there's so much discrimination um, and health and social care and employment nobody really supports there's no strategic network of supporting carers so i'm trying to sort of do the grassroots mm -hmm. work on one-to-one -one and groups but also working with professionals to um ensure that they're able to support the caregiver network as well better because it eventually it's going to affect every single one of us we're either going to be cared for or we're going to be carers regardless you know all across the world this isn't exclusive to Leicester um, and a lot of my members I set up a carers health and well-being forum at, at a group on Facebook which is actually going to turn one this Sunday so 25th of July 25th of July, I set it up last year. I hoped wow. I could help one or two people. It's gone from strength to strength. And, you know, I'm working with different organisations. I'm working with, I've, I've worked internationally, but I'm helping people internationally working on their, you know, collaborating with how they can develop support with different organisations, you know, employers. I'm working with um, just, just lots of global influencing panels now in terms of how we can support that and build collections and reduce isolation and reduce loneliness and also tackle well-being and empower women and other carers because I'm working on with male carers and male mental health is another sort of passion of mine I'm trying to support um yeah so keeping busy by just supporting the the the, the world out there and and campaigning changing legislation making changes at a little level but also going into education and and catering for carers in the education system as well as training professionals who are coming out as professionals working with carers I'm doing a lot of training of those to make sure that they treat the caregiver and take on their rights I'm at the moment currently particularly this week I've been on roundtable discussions in how to shape uh, mental health services particularly for caregivers as well um, because I think that's a, an area that is not inclusive that's not really considered uh, and also seeing the caregiver as an expert around the table when shaping health services and social care services so there's a combination of that advocacy that campaigning shaping things through consultancy and 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 supporting individuals at crisis point as well and also prevention of burnout is a big thing which i've been doing so that's it in summary I know um, that, that as as I said, your list is already so long, and I, I I know that your list is going to get much longer because of COVID. Actually, uh, you know, there's so many issues that are going to come out uh, that we all together need to address. And as we know, um, the BME communities have been, um, you know, impacted more in some ways than others, um, and. Uh, yeah so so i look forward to working with you at some point um thank you for that raj um we were going to have uh, uh, various other people but i mean not that we would have ever managed all of them but there was supposed to be um the co-founders of we grow forest um and aminaka from the um transformational lab uh we were going to have banu jadeja mahal the first police officer in in Europe, actually, in 1970, around 1970, um, and literally, this uh, is actually this. This was our experiment, if you want to call it that, um, in delivering this event to see what, if any, um, response we get. And within days, we've had this much response. Imagine what impact South Asian women are making. This is not the end. Tomorrow we have another event uh, where we 
you know, looking at um, um, including uh, men and women uh, in, within the NHS consultants and engineers and economists and, and those kind of um, individuals. Uh, and some of the individuals on this session may be joining us then. Um, but um, uh, um, before we finish then, uh, we, we do have some videos to show, but um, as, I'm, as I promised before, um, I would like first I, uh, Iona to uh, read another poem, if she would be, uh, you know, graces with an, another one of her lovely poems. That would be gorgeous. Thank you. Thank you. you. That's very flattering. Um, I'd like to read uh, my second poem, which is titled Kintsugi. Um, and Kintsugi is actually an ancient Japanese art form which involves repairing uh, broken objects with a kind of gold paint in between the cracks. And the real philosophy behind that is that um, repairing a broken object can be just as beautiful as how it was before it broke. And it also talks about kind of embracing your imperfections. And I think with the overarching theme of mental health, um, this is something which I very strongly believe in and I think would be great to share too. Thank so you. here's Kintsugi. No one heard a sound as mothers once in a blue moon, swan-necked Grecian vase hit the ground. Its faint turquoise depth uneven rose glow at the edge, lay on deathbed, shattered in fragments as I stood aghast, hands bruised from remnants. Women dancing with liars by the river, resting in smithereens on the floor, their grip on grapes held, lost in their fingers. Swaying hips stuck in motion, half broken smiles crying for help. I had just killed a civilization, mocking it with my fingers. Once a city hard to believe, now a mosaic in ruins, ravaged to the ground. Truly, emptiness had never felt so heavy before. Yet, feeding the scars with golden ambrosia, dripping from fingertips, gratefulness in fillings, crisscrossing in crooks and crannies, indulging to perfection each dent I made, each splinter rise, revive and enliven in soft, hushed whispers, as if not to frighten, arose unequal music from the liars. Lips smiled in gentleness. The river flowed again through crazed, apparently irrevocable breaks, distilling the pain, droplet by droplet, in nuggets of gold as if moulded by the gods for civilization to cradle. Healed, the cracks glistened beautiful again. Life renewed, stronger and alive, its imperfections embraced, in treasuring the truth of asymmetry, in recognition of incompleteness, in brokenness. Yeah. Well, all I can say is I think we will need to view this video again to take <laughs> what you just said in that poem because Thank it's so you. deep, so deep. I take my hat off to you. Um, <laughs> do you know, whilst you were reading that, um, I, I just cannot remember the the, po the, the poet that did the um, inauguration of uh, um, uh, Biden. Um, I can't remember her name, but anyway, I know, I know, you, I know you'll be collaborating with her at some point. And, and to the audience, I say, you saw her here first. That's what. 
<laughs> so, and, and uh, what we'll do is, um, I don't think we really have time for a discussion, but it just goes to show we may have another event of all those people that were joining us today uh, before the month is out to get that discussion going, hopefully. But what we'll do is the two videos that we were supposed to be playing, we'll play them and then we'll bring back uh, Iona for her uh, third um, uh, uh, poem, which is um, really powerful as well. Um, so if we can play Pam, Pam Sidhu's video. Now Pam is a um, well-known uh, radio presenter in Leicester um, and she, she's um, quite heavily involved within the communities and I think she, I'll let her speak for herself in the video. Thank you. Hi, I'm Pam Sidhu. Delighted to be asked to make this video to share my journey with you today. So I have been really interested in the mind and how the mind works and how we can take charge of our thoughts because we can't control what's happening out there, but we can control what's happening in there. Um, so I've been on numerous different courses over the years. I now, um, you know, I teach NLP, I teach mindfulness, I help people relax because especially through the pandemic, no matter what has been going on, it's still happening. You know, whatever's happening is happening, it's going to happen, but we can choose how we react through that. So if we stay relaxed, it just makes it that little bit easier. As they say, there's a very famous mindfulness saying, you can't stop the waves, but you can learn how to surf. So when we stay relaxed, we can just learn how to surf that little bit easier when those big waves come, such as what's been happening in the last year with the pandemic. And it's really good for, um, you know, relaxing the body, helping the body heal as well, um, and moving forward as well out of trauma. So for those of us who have suffered loss, whether it's finance, whether it's a, a family member or a friend, it's a really good way of just helping ourselves through that. So as I said, I'm fascinated on the mind. I'm fascinated on bringing happiness to people, bringing peace to people um, through all these different things. And it's like I've got a little toolbox, you know, so it's like, okay, what tool can I pull out now? And so another tool that I have is I'm also a radio presenter. I do the drive time show on Sudbridge Radio. Uh, I've been doing radio now for about four years. Um, I've always had the gift of the gap, always been told I talk too much. Now um, I've been let loose on the airway, so I actually get to do it on air and um, play some great music. And again, it's all about, you know, I think to myself, I think if I can make one person smile, then a job done. You know, that's um, a good thing that I'm doing that in terms of just, you know, playing some happy music, having some happy talk, um, regardless of what might be happening in our lives personally or societally, globally. So you can catch me on drive time three till six, Monday to Friday on Subbrush Radio. You don't need to be local. You can listen online and, uh, you know, catch those musical ways, catch those, those good ways, those positive ways. Um, also, I've been involved with COS. I love the work that they're doing. It's all about promoting peace. And that's what it's all about, especially in today's times. So big, big up to COS. And um, yeah, if you want to connect with me, you can connect with me on social media. I'm there under Pam Sidhu. And I'd love to hear from you. Um, but uh, keep on influencing, keep on making that positive difference just one step at a time. As I said, even if we can influence one person and help one person smile, then surely we're making that difference. Take care and enjoy the rest of your evening. And the um, uh, video that's coming up next is from Professor Monica Luckenball. She couldn't uh, attend today, but um, she's got some important information about research. Um, so if we can play that and then we'll round it off with um, Iona's um, last poem and I it just leaves me to say thank you for joining us please join us tomorrow same time 3 30 uh, sorry 5 30 and uh, we have another set of people with a different um, um, sort of you know areas of work that uh, we'd like to share those stories with you so thank you very much thank you My name is Professor Monica Lackenpaul at University College London. Together with my colleagues at De Montfort University, we will be carrying out the Champions Project. In this project, we'll be working with families of children under five years who've experienced homelessness or have been living in temporary accommodation for all of the COVID pandemic or even part of the COVID pandemic. 
In this project, we want to hear the voices of families, the problems they have gone through during the pandemic, and some of the ways they've found solutions to the problems that they've gone through. We want to share these experiences, share these stories with service providers and with policymakers in England. And through these experiences and stories, we hope to co-create solutions to give our children a better future. We need your help to do this. We're looking for families who will be happy to take part in an interview and or take part in a survey as well. And we know how precious family time is and therefore we will provide a voucher to thank you all for the time you give to us. We also know that some of the information may be confidential. So before we use it, we'll ask all of you if we can share that information in a confidential way. And if within a month you feel that you want to delete any of your information, you don't want us to use it, please just contact us and we will do that for you. In the meantime, if you have any questions, any thoughts, anything you want to ask us at all, you can contact us by phone or through our website or through our email and we'll be happy to answer any questions you have. But in the meantime, please think of taking part in this important project that will improve the lives of our children together with you for their future. Thank you. Hi again, um, I'd like to read my final poem, which is titled Chameleon. Um, growing up, I felt like I had two very distinct identities, um, one which I kept reserved for school and the people there, but a different one which was for the people at home, because see seeing as I'm South Asian, I'm Indian, yet living in the UK, obviously the two cultures are very starkly different. Um, the food is different, the language is different, you know, there are boundless things I could talk about. But um, this poem is about learning to balance those two identities and really loving and appreciating all the parts which make me, me. So here's Chameleon. No matter where I belong to, traipsing through different quarters in my town is like a portal to a parallel universe. My legs are almost like an aeroplane, landing effortlessly across alien climbs into each house, where space changes, as does colour. My eyes serve as my kaleidoscope, interpreting a similar situation to perspectives so varied, yet all so similar. My tongue a tapestry of flavours, like a crayon melting over a candle, leaving a taste of namelessness in the mouth. My lips like tangerines soak in the poetry of each language I hear, one word in, another out. My nose breathes the aroma of the best Sunday roasts and traditional spices in home cooking. My hands need the same lump of dough, puff pastry in school, naan bread at home. My arms like stairway railings are those my brother clutches onto when he cries, and those my beautifully diverse friends hold as we walk home. No matter what food I eat or clothes I wear, culture and religion I practice, my conscience abides unable to alter. In this algorithm of variables, my soul remains the only constant. Some call it change, I call it adaptation. Thank you.